Okay, so welcome to our study abroad podcast series. So today we have Ritwik, who is from India, and then he studied at Hong Kong, and now he is in US. So we'll be knowing about his journey from India to Hong Kong to US. So welcome, Ritwik. Hi, Vishal. Thank you so much for inviting me on this podcast. So, Ritwik, when was your uh, first time when you thought that uh, there are few countries outside India? It was actually in tenth uh, grade. So one of my cousins uh, who grew up in the U.S. had come to visit uh, us in Bangalore uh, for like a internship in uh, one of the hospitals there, and um, she told me about college life in 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 the U.S. and you know like different opportunities that you can get outside of India, like you know different schooling systems, and that's how I kind of got interested into it and started looking into it myself. Okay. so you know what's the college what's college life like in india after you graduate what's college life like in the us you know what, what are different institutes that people uh, in bangalore or like in my school generally go to after graduating and like you know uh, what have their experiences been like and that's how i started getting interested into it started looking into it it was a uh, it was very um, there was so many different opportunities to go study in like various parts of the world and you know i was very fascinated by that sure 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 so i see that you did your bachelors from hong kong so when you were deciding about your bachelors uh, how many countries colleges and courses did you consider while choosing the course mm. so i was interested um it was in the last two years of uh, my school 11th and 12th grade I did an elective called biotechnology uh, in um, in ISC in the ISC curriculum, and so I I was pretty sure that I wanted to follow something uh, along biotechnology or like biomedical engineering. So I started looking into universities or uh, and you know places which have like a strong uh, biomedical engineering environment or like who have a, a strong research component to them. So I I looked into the US, I looked into the UK, and I looked into Hong Kong. and um, yeah i applied uh, in the uk I, i not in the uk exactly but in europe i applied to only one university in europe uh, i was i think uh, the university of glasgow there um, in the us i applied to a couple of places uh, georgia tech i applied to uh, stanford i applied to uh, johns hopkins and in hong kong i applied to um, hku cdu and hkust and all of these universities had like really strong research components to them in the biomedical engineering field so that's how i started looking into it and how did you pin down to one of them so um in initially i started applying to all of these places um based on i think two two requirements one was like would i be interested to go and like live in these countries for a certain period of time and what was the research environment like you know how many publications did they have what kind of research do they do and i found like several universities uh, very interesting universities in the us and in in, uh, in hong kong um however um i wanted to be relatively close to a uh, home you know so i could come pretty quickly if i if i needed to and uh and also like the tuition fee was a big requirement because uh, many of the many of the us institutes they their tuition fees especially for undergrad is like a, a lot they they charge a lot of money and uh, i wanted to see if i could get a scholarship for if i could get a scholarship to study in the us i i might have done that um but i did get scholarships in some institutes but uh, they weren't a lot and the the tuition fee was still an incredible um, amount in hong kong however i I found the an institute city you had was ranked number one on a time in in Asia for like biomedical engineering, and they also gave me a scholarship to study there. So I was getting undergraduate education for free. So that that was an incredible opportunity. So that it was an easy pick after that. So this scholarship covered like uh, the tuition fee and more, or it was tuition fee plus something. How, how was the scholarship like? so there are different tiers of this of this scholarship so you have the lowest tier which covers about a uh, half of your tuition fee uh, the second tier which covers your entire tuition fee and then the third tier which covers your entire tuition fee a uh, fee plus your uh, living costs and it gives you an additional stipend to spend uh, on i think like a six monthly basis they give you a stipend so the, these are three layers and getting these scholarships is uh, pretty much dependent on your uh, on your board marks 
So depending on how well you perform in your board exams, you can get one of these scholarships. So I got like the hundred percent tuition fee waiver. So uh, it covered my tuition fee for four years. Okay, okay, sure, sure, sure. And after you did uh, City University of Hong Kong, you also came to Harvard, right? Yeah. How was that decision? Like uh, after doing the bachelor's, you wanted to apply to some master's program, probably. So how many? college course etc you consider at that time yeah so i towards the end of my undergraduate i think like towards the end of my third year beginning of my fourth year i started thinking about what i wanted to do after graduating and and many people wanted to you know uh, start getting like jobs but uh, i i was still thinking about um, you know my field i wanted to stay in the healthcare side and biomedical engineering side and i was uh, i wanted to get into research i wanted to get i was doing research i wanted to get deeper into research um at the time i was working on a startup where, like building up uh, a research project of mine uh, i was converting that into a startup you know meeting with the investors trying to raise some money uh, i was working on it for a bit and i realized uh, it was it was a drug discovery startup and i realized that uh, the project was still very um, Uh, it was a very manual process, and at that point, you know, having a computational element to drug discovery would be would be really um, it would open up a lot of opportunities for for the company, and that's how I started looking into uh, you know building up my skills in uh, the computational side uh, more, uh, learning about how the computational drug discovery or like artificial intelligence works in the space, and I uh, while researching talk. Kingdom investors, top people. I realized that there are the uh, there are you know masters programs in the US. There's some a couple of masters programs in the US that um, that are really good for this type of stuff. So I, I looked at Harvard. I looked at uh, Stanford. I looked at Columbia University. Uh, I looked at Johns Hopkins, Rice University, uh, Carnegie Mellon. The the these yeah these universities. For like uh, master's programs in either you know biomedical engineering or uh, biomedical informatics, computational biology, that type of stuff, and I started applying to these universities because um, in Hong Kong uh, I had I had a job offer to work as a software engineer, but I realized that if I if I did end up working there, I I'll probably have to like leave the healthcare space and like you know I wouldn't be able to apply for a master's degree. After maybe like a year or two, if I work in the space and then apply for a master's degree, they might be they might ask, okay, you you know you were out of it for two years, um, you know you you have no ex- you you didn't do research in that period. Why do you want to come back into this field? So I thought towards the end of my fourth year, I thought this was probably like the best time to if I wanted to continue for grad school, this might be the best time for me to you know start looking into it. So that's how I started applying, and you know then interviewing with these universities. So at the Hong Kong University, you got this hundred uh, percent tuition fee waiver. So were you expecting a better offer from the master's universities? Yeah, <laughs> I was. I I was hoping to uh, you know I, it would be it would be nice if uh, if I could uh, just do my entire both my degrees for free. That would have been amazing. But uh, I actually I did get um, scholarships from some masters applications that I applied to. I applied to Carnegie Mellon and I applied to. Uh, University of Michigan. So University of Michigan gave me a fifty percent scholarship. So I I have to like it would pay off my fees uh, by half. And Carnegie Mellon also gave me like uh, roughly the same amount of scholarship. But uh, but then when you get an offer from Harvard, you know it's really it's hard to say no at that point. I didn't get I didn't get a scholarship for this, but uh, you know it was it was Harvard and the program was really interesting. So I kind of just ended up picking this program. You were happy with the prestige, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The prestige, you know, uh, being really close to the research. There's some professors here I've been reading about uh, for like years, and now you know, having getting the chance to like talk to them and do research with them was uh, was not something I wanted to say no to. Sure, sure. So you know, this this cultural difference of uh, India and abroad that you have to do your cooking, cleaning, etc. by your own. Yeah. <laughs> so one transition yeah. was obviously India to Hong Kong. and the second transition was hong kong to us so how do you see these yeah. two transition uh, adjusting yourself to it it actually i think i think it fit really well because because hong kong felt like a nice buffer in between the us and india uh, hong kong is a 
you know the us is a uh, very westernized obviously and hong kong is a little bit more westernized than india in terms of culture but it's still uh, also quite traditional and also i think there's a huge indian population in hong kong as well so you know it, it uh, uh, in my cohort uh, there were so many indians that didn't really feel like i was away from home so it was like a nice buffer in between um, you know from in india i was at i was at home and uh, pretty much you know if um, uh, like we had we had a help or we had or my parents they would handle pretty much everything so you know i i wasn't i didn't have to a lot mental space to like cook my lunch or my dinner or think about food as much but then come come to college and you're you know pretty much on your own so you're figuring things out on your own but uh, the sense of community uh, i think among the indians was, str- was pretty strong in hong kong so you know it was still it still felt quite like home but then then coming here it's like um, i think the us is uh, very you know individualistic every every man for themselves kind of uh, that's kind of the vibe so here it's pretty much um, you know you you if you have a problem you pretty much have to figure it out on your own unless you know you you're building like a really strong uh, connection with your friends here then it becomes like easier but in the beginning it's like you know you do you're dealing with everything on your own which is also i think a really uh, nice experience you know it really helps you grow up sure sure so you know people feel good actually if they are not stuck in the lift alone so did you ever mm. felt like that that okay you know i am maybe stuck in the lift of hong kong let's say so called hong kong but mm. there are so many other yeah. people who are also stuck so you know, let's just figure things out together <laughs> yeah i i think that is that is exactly that is like the best description of how i how it is you know especially when you're just starting out college um, it's kind of like your uh, it's kind of like you're just entering you know your adult life so you're stuck you're stuck in the lift you're like oh, it's you know it's getting hard it's so it's 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 kind of crowded you don't know what to do but there are also other people who are also don't know what to do you're so you're kind of just thinking about what to do together and you're just like okay you know what can we do how, how do we figure this out and i think that's that's very fun yeah yeah you all uh, decide how to figure things out together right so it's it's fun yeah. that way. peer learning a lot of peer learning peer learning yeah you're confused together but that gives you direction also correct 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 so what about part time jobs and internships that you have been doing so far so um they're different like in in undergrad i did a couple of internships i uh, i did a couple of research i did um, research in uh, in my university part time it was a little uh, it was a little awkward cuz um, when i was in hong kong uh, during that time it was uh, right before the start of covid and at that time in hong kong there were a couple of political un- unrest going on at that point as well so it was very on and off we would be there in hong kong sometimes that we'd have to like uh, we'd have to come back to india because you know the situation wasn't very good then we went back and then covid happened so we kind of i i think we kind of lost out on like the first two years of our university life it was pretty much online but then after that uh, we started looking into you know internships and like doing research i th- i think my my first job ever um, i just i did it just because i wanted to make money i was short on cash at that time i uh, i cleaned uh, aquariums uh, like fish tanks for you know some some money they paid me by the hour so I, i would go into like a research lab and i would just clean that fish tanks and then refill the water deal with the fish i did that for a couple of hours in the day made some money and then you know just lived my life but then after that point i started looking into like doing actual research work in uh, in labs so i worked with a professor i i feel like professors are very happy uh, when students reach out especially when you show like an interest in the research cuz you know uh, they have allotted uh, budget in their uh, a lot allotted money in the budget for like student research also they more than happy to like use it um, for them as long as people reach out you know so just send do a little bit of background research on the professors email them talk to them be like i am interested in your work this is why i am interested uh, you know could i set up like a time to get to talk to you or if you have an opening in a lab could i join that type of stuff professors many times they would reply being yeah definitely uh, let's set up a time to talk and so i i worked with a professor in the electrical engineering department doing some research for her and then i worked again in in the chemistry department i ended up doing research in the chemistry department for 2 years 
uh, I got a publication out of it. So it was it was pretty uh, um, pretty useful for me, especially for grad school when you apply. You know, if you have publications, it's uh, it's, it's pretty uh, helpful in your application. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. That that's great to know. And how did you find all these internships, part time jobs, etc. that you opted for? So uh, the way I looked into it was um, first I. Um, I, it was different for internships and different for research. So for research, generally the best thing you can do is probably just look into your own university and look into your own department. So the way I looked into it was like, what kind of research do I want to do? What is the field that I want to work in? And then find professors in my department first who do that kind of research. And after that, probably short look at other departments who are doing similar kind of research, but it's easiest to start with your own department. And then just start, uh, you know, looking into the research these professors do, looking at their website, looking at their profiles, maybe finding one or two recent papers they've published and like just read a bit about those papers, just gather my thoughts and then just send an email to those professors with my thoughts on their research. Just like, uh, dear professor, um, Thank you for uh, thank you for, for can I thank you I hope you're fine um, I'm really interested in looking for you know some research positions and labs I noticed your research I read these these papers I thought this was incredible some thoughts about those research papers I would really um, it would be great if I could make have 15 minutes of your time to you know just talk about any open research positions or you know why I would be a good fit could I please, you know, join your lab? And in many, in most cases, professors have reached back out saying, yeah, you know, definitely we can meet up on Zoom or we can meet up in person, talk about your work. And uh, yeah, that's how I looked into doing research. Internship, internships are a little different because, you know, you have to cast a wider net uh, to get, um, you know, opportunities. So the way I did it was, um, it was through primarily through, um, Three things I would say. The first would be uh, my university's portal. So my university had its own designated job portal and most universities do. So just going up there and like looking for if any professors, uh, any professors are looking for some someone to do an internship with them. Is any company reaching out for internships, uh, you know, uh, that they have open for the summer or over, over the winter? And uh, just applying through that. The second was going through LinkedIn. So just, you know, going on LinkedIn's job portal to see what's available, uh, looking at companies on LinkedIn, and then reaching out to people um, that work at those companies. You know, I, I was uh, striking a balance between uh, lower level employees and high, higher level employees, because generally higher level employees don't have the time for this. So they, they don't, you know, they won't bother replying to your email. Lower level employees have much more time, much more energy. So, you know, reaching out to them and just talking to them about their roles and understanding if they have, you know, openings in their team. And finally, just like uh, many big companies have, you know, uh, designated summer internship programs, they open up applications to, in, in I think the, the fall of the previous year, like towards the end of the previous year, they open up applications for the summer of next year. So just uh, applying for those positions as they come out, you know, the earlier you apply, the better. So just keep applying. The, and then that's how I ended up getting uh, many of the internships that I did in undergrad and even now. Sure. You also went to MIT for like few months, right? Tell us a bit about that. Yeah. So um, the thing, what I, I realized uh, when I got here that um, Harvard and MIT have a really strong connection between them. Like MIT is very uh, engineering focused. Harvard is very like uh, liberal arts, medicine, uh, science focused. And so they they try to fill in the gaps of each other wherever one university is a little weaker, the other university fills up. So whenever, uh, you know, if there's a student at MIT who wants to do a course at Harvard, uh, he can. If there's a student at Harvard who wants to do a course at MIT, uh, he or she can. They have, they have complete freedom to travel between the universities. So when I got here, I learned about this and I was like, that's an incredible opportunity to be able to, you know, a study at MIT and then network with those professors and the students. So I think last semester, uh, I decided to apply to a couple of courses at MIT. And I ended up, I'm doing a course this semester. and I did a course last semester 
so i just do i go to courses i go to the classes i get to talk to the mit students i have a mit id so it feels like i'm a student at mit and you know just uh, network with professors that it's a, it's a, i i would say the the students at mit are very um, i as some of the smartest students i've ever seen they have very uh, technical minds you know they they are very uh, even even the freshmen are very, are already like very engineering mindset type students and it's an incredible opportunity to talk to them sure 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 and your accommodation how did you book your accommodation of hong kong versus us how was the comparison uh, like oh okay yeah i i think i got a little lucky uh, in terms of my accommodation so in in hong kong it was uh, it was fairly straightforward they have for the first two years most international students have uh, you know they have to uh, they get like guaranteed accommodation in the dorms on campus and after the first two years it's it's like a competitive thing uh, you have to compete with other students um, for uh, housing space for your third year and your fourth year uh so in in each of the dorms you uh you have you can organize different events you can take part in like sports activities that dorms have against each other uh different types of activities to just you know uh bring prestige to your dorm in that doing that gets you points and then you can live uh, then you can you know continue living in your third year and your fourth year and uh, so i ended up doing that and getting accommodation in in hong kong but in the us uh, that's not the case you know you can live for as long as you pay for but uh, i'm also living in a dorm a harvard's dorm here in the U- in, in the us but uh, this uh, this dorm is very competitive it was very it, it, the the longer you take the harder it becomes for you to get a spot because a lot of people want it so i i found out about that early so i applied i think as soon as the application opened a minute after the application opened i applied and i ended up getting a room that way um, but many other people that applied a little later they ended up not getting a room and they had to like find apartments outside so yeah i think i got a little lucky in that sense sure sure what about the visa process of hong kong versus us oh yeah <laughs> i think the visa process of uh, hong kong was much much easier than the than the visa process of the us uh, because uh, in indians get on arrival visa in hong kong you know it's like if you're a tourist you get on arrival visa for i think about 90 day 30 to 90 days i'm not sure uh, so you know india and hong kong have a pretty good relationship so when you wanted a work visa it didn't take uh, much effort there was an online application and you know you just had to fill up the application and uh, deposit your passport and you would get you get the visa in a couple of days it wasn't uh, it wasn't much work that way um the 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 us application uh, if i was applying from india i would have it would have taken me an, a long time because the wait times just to get the interview appointment was uh, was a, was a, was very long 6 uh, 5 to 6 months at the time that i was looking into it uh, but uh, i applied for my uh, visa in uh, in hong kong because i was i was still living in hong kong at that time so i got my visa appointment i think within 2 weeks and i interviewed i gave them my passport and then 24 hours later i had my visa so it wasn't it wasn't much of a hassle because i was applying from uh, in hong kong but in india if i was looking to you know do grad school i would probably have to like plan out everything months in advance uh, just so i could get like an interview spot and then you know uh, get get the interview done and get my visa also i think the expense is more pro for us probably the visa fee uh the visa fee yeah definitely the visa fee in hong kong was not was not a lot uh, compared to the one in the us yeah sure so sure. same goes for the flight duration and the flight prices how did you fly to us and hong kong in your initial days uh yeah hong kong i mean because it's so close it's so cheap you know uh, uh i think the prices have gone up a little bit but like uh when i was when i was traveling to hong kong like uh, a one way flight ticket to hong kong would have would cost i think around 20000 rupees uh from bangalore to hong kong and there was a direct flight that indigo had but uh, now i don't think that they have that option anymore i think they have to go through delhi if you want to travel to hong kong now and the prices have gone up 
bit, especially during the pandemic, the prices were really high. They were hitting around fifty, sixty thousand. It was, it was a real pain. Um, and it's uh, five and a half hours, six hours. It's a six hour flight to Hong Kong from Bangalore. Uh, I think five hours from Delhi. So it wasn't like uh, it was super convenient to travel between Hong Kong and India, and like you know, uh, it wasn't that expensive. But uh, traveling from India to the US is considerably expensive. Dep- also depending on when you book your ticket, because um, I had I ended up booking my flight tickets maybe a month or two in advance, and it still cost me a lot of money. I think it it was around uh, one point five lakhs uh, for a. a uh, a flight direct flight not direct flight but a flight from bangalore to uh, uh to the us to boston uh, through british airways a really expensive flight that's why uh, i haven't gone back uh, to india in the last year and a half uh, i'm still here i'm uh, hoping to just finish my degree get a job and then probably go back visit family for sure, sure and uh... you went to us directly from hong kong or you came back to india and then you moved to us no i i came back to india first so i i um, i graduated in uh, june of 2023 and i came back to india for a, for like a month or two you know just spend time with family uh, go to like spend time with family in De- bangalore go to delhi meet you know meet up with uh, other family cousins all of that uh, some friends and uh, yeah then i then i left for the us in like end of august and this was your first time in us it was my second time second time in the us i had i had gone to the us once before um in uh, like in my first year of college to uh, to meet my uh, cousins in the us just as like a like a vacation like a family trip I hadn't seen them in like several years. I think last time I met them was like ten years before that. So just went just to see them. That was my first time, and then then this was my second time. So when you came the first time to US, did you see any of these colleges to get some inspiration that time? Oh uh, no! <laughs> uh, the first time I went, uh, I went to uh, Texas. So. Uh, to like you know meet cousins and stuff and the and the entire event like the entire vacation was like quite planned out yeah we'd be doing this we'd be doing that so i didn't really have the opportunity to go looking into universities and the first time i went it was in 2019 so i just started college and I, I, you know i hadn't really thought about further education i wasn't really thinking about further education at that point i was just like yeah i'm i'm going to the us i'm going to see what all the hype is about i'm going to have some fun that's that's what it is yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. Uh, what are your future goals for the next few years? The next few years, uh, you know, the, I feel like uh, in in an environment like here, there's like always so much going on that I feel like my future goals are kind of always changing at this point because I'm always talking to people who are doing like really incredible things. I'm like, yeah, maybe I could do that. Maybe I could do this. But I guess um, I think at at the minimum, I probably want to work. in uh, research and development for the next uh one or two years maybe like maybe three years you know uh, do r and d research in uh, in the biotech field and biomedical engineering field and i'm i'm you know i f- i feel like i want to start my own business so probably after that look into uh like you know how like how can i start my own business here you know what what can i do that type of, that type of stuff but i think over the next two years probably just make money so i can i have some savings cuz i'm i'm pretty broke right now so you know just build up some money first sure sure, sure. coming to the very last question uh, what advice would you give to younger yourself or people like you you know who are thinking about studying abroad mm-hmm. for their bachelor's or masters or something ah uh, yeah that's a that's a good one what advice could i give let's see um i think I think I I don't I think there'd be two pieces of advice that I I would give. One, I I think being able to leave the comfort of your home to to go live in a completely new environment and experience life on your own is a really uh, rewarding experience. Uh, it's it really helps you grow up. It really helps you uh, you know. 
uh, think of yourself uh, as an individual and learn about yourself uh, by yourself. And I would I would always recommend uh, someone who is considering uh, you know going to college in a in a country or in a state that is um, that is different from where they grew up uh, because I think it's an incredible opportunity. I think if if you're considering that, I, uh, if you're if you're thinking about that, I think really consider it because it's a, it's an incredible opportunity. Uh, but the second thing is, uh, I don't think uh, the US is necessarily a is a great place for undergraduate education. If you have the money for it, uh, I would say sure, uh, go for it if you're considering it. But I think for an undergraduate education, uh, staying in India or like staying in countries that are that are new developing countries closer by to india i think is a better financial investment because it's is not as expensive and and you still get to experience a lot of different opportunities and you get to do a lot of different cool things that you wouldn't have thought you could do before so i would i would say that if you're considering a college abroad uh, don't just consider the us uh, i think us is good for grad school and much more affordable for grad school but i think that uh, you know college in college in india and different parts of india and college in in hong kong especially because their tuition their ex- scholarships are still great and like other places closer by to india is also a, would also provide incredible opportunities so yeah you know um, be be confident about uh, what you want to do i would definitely consider going abroad and don't just pigeonhole yourself to the US, consider other universities as well. Sure, sure, sure. Any recommendation on LinkedIn usage? A lot of people are, you know, prefer Instagram over LinkedIn. What's your take on that? <laughs> <laughs> I I think LinkedIn and Instagram are two different uh, social media platforms. You know, they're, they're, they're for different things. Uh, so Instagram is, you know, for fun. Instagram uh, is is for your friends. Yeah, LinkedIn is is more professional. But I, I think they're becoming quite similar now. I see people put up stories on LinkedIn. I see people put up reels on LinkedIn. And like uh, I clicked on a video once and it told me to keep scrolling. So, you know, all these social media apps are like, you know, trying to get you to do, get into that scrolling habit that they just want data collection at this point. But yeah, you know, I would say, I would say LinkedIn is filled with a lot of fluff. You know, people, are, that's what it's for. You know, you're like talking about yourself and you're, you, you're not going to, you're not going to talk yourself down. You have to show yourself off and on LinkedIn. So I would say whatever you see on LinkedIn, take it with a pinch of salt because it's uh, 90% of the time it's not uh, accurate. You know, people have just like fluffed it up a lot. And it's similar with Instagram, but, you know, Instagram is more for social, you know, you're living your social life, showing your social life. So just, yeah, always take uh, whatever you see online, especially on the social media platforms with a pinch of salt. With a pinch of salt. And use them to your advantage. You know, uh, if you want to, uh, if you want to show off a certain lifestyle, yeah, I mean, take advantage of it. That's what it's for. Uh, if on LinkedIn, reach out to people. You know, uh, talk to people on LinkedIn. Use it to network, and you know, talk about yourself. That's that's what it's for. Just take advantage of these platforms rather than getting uh, really engrossed into what other people are doing. Sure, sure. That's a good advice. You know, take advantage of the situation rather than yeah. other side. <laughs> Yeah, don't get into that scroll. Just you know, <laughs> use it. That's what it's for. It's a tool. Okay, sure, sure. Th- uh, thank you, Ritwik, uh, for your uh, insights and your tips to our aspirants. So, thank you very much for your time, and we hope uh, all your dreams are fulfilled in the near future. So, have a good day. Thank you, thank you so much. It was uh, it was really nice sharing my experience with you. Hopefully, my experience um, helps other students in their journey for you know college abroad or just uh, you know different research experiences abroad i think it's really helpful yeah sure sure thank you bye thank you so much